The first few months of All Japan in 1994 are incredibly uneventful. That may sound like an exaggeration, but consider that before the Champion Carnival, Baba didn't run a single Triple Crown Championship match or even a World Tag Team Championship match. This creates a sense of stagnation that's only compounded by the fact that both those titles are held by Mitsuharu Misawa. There's so much nothing going on in this time of the year that Baba actually has the audacity to run a 30-minute time limit draw between Akira Tawe and Kenta Kobashi on March 24th for the Champion Carnival. Just three days later, Tawe and Kobashi would have a rematch of their block match, and it also ends in a 30-minute draw. Zero progress. Zero development. Two 30-minute draws from the same two wrestlers within a week of each other. That's stardom levels of abusing time limit draws for little to no purpose. Things only really start rolling once the carnival itself gets going. And even there, we have some questionable booking decisions. The carnival in 94 featured a field of 12 wrestlers in a single block. In his second block match against Doug Furness, Mitsuharu Misawa sustains a kayfabe neck injury that takes him out of the carnival and forcing him to forfeit the rest of his matches. Of course, this is to protect Misawa from losses while clearing the table to allow Baba to build new stars through the carnival, but it's an inelegant solution to say the least. Why not split the field into two blocks? They'd done it in 91, and New Japan had already showed how a reigning champion could be protected while still clearing the field for a finals centered around two new stars. Hate to say it, but Baba took the easy way out here, coasting on the success of post-Jumbo All Japan to carry the promotion. This whole first half of 94 feels like coasting with Baba not booking anything to develop or change among the top stars of the time. There's no forward movement whatsoever. With that being said, we do eventually get some interesting developments in the carnival itself. On March 29th, we get the block stage match between eventual finalists Steve Williams and Toshiaki Kawada. We only have this match in clipped form, missing about 10 minutes off the top, in what we do have, we see Kawada enjoying the early advantage until he accidentally kicks a ring post and damages his leg. While Doc is in control, one thing I especially enjoy is how Kawada sells his absolute fear of the backdrop driver as a match-ending move. It's something Kawada's always excelled at in his matches. By the end of the match, Kawada is firmly in control, trying to find just the right combination to put away Williams, but Doc is just always able to survive. The match ends in a 30-minute time limit draw, but one certainly gets the impression that with a few more minutes, Kawada would have had the win. A couple weeks later on April 10th, we get Kobashi vs. Hansen in the Champion Carnival. This installment distinguishes itself from past iterations of this match in one simple way. When the bell rings, it feels like Kobashi's the man to beat, not Hansen. Hansen doesn't respond to that feeling kindly. If anything, he's even more petty and brutal and also throws a fucking table at Kobashi's head. Hansen's use of weapons in this match tells the story of his desperation as he can feel Kobashi finally eclipsing him for the first time in the decade. In the end, Kobashi nails two beautiful moonsaults to finally get his first singles win over Stan Hansen. This match actually rules, and it's the first truly great match in All Japan all year, and it's a nice piece of development for Kobashi's character to finally overcome this hurdle. On April 15th, Steve Williams punches his ticket to the finals after wrestling Kanta Kobashi. Much like their other matches together, this is just a fun bomb fest with a lot of gross bumps towards the end. Kobashi sells them so well, and of course, Doc ends up winning the match in the end to make it into the finals. April 16th, Budokan Hall, the finals of the Champion Carnival. Neither Kawada nor Williams have ever made it to the finals before, and it's the first time in the 90s that the Triple Crown Champion hasn't made it to the finals either. Only one can come through the other side as the victor. 
After establishing his strength early, Doc goes for the backdrop driver which Kawada just barely escapes before nailing a backdrop of his own. Doc is able to take the advantage back though. He's such a broad, beefy man that he's capable of absorbing punishment and pushing through to deal it out himself. The match tells the story of Kawada working to pick his spots and chip away at the bigger man's defenses while Doc utilizes his power to wear Kawada down. Kawada's bit-by-bit attack is enough to buy him time. Once Doc is finally able to nail the backdrop, he's worn down just enough that Kawada can roll out of the ring to avoid the pinfall. From there, it's a matter of Kawada throwing himself at Doc with strikes to continue chipping away at the big man. Of course, it's Kawada's resilience and ability to keep pushing even when the chips are down that allows him to stay alive in the fight. It takes all the best tools in his arsenal to wear down Doc, and two folding power bombs to finally get the victory. This is a very straightforward match, a large, powerful foreigner against the scrappy native worker, a simple babyface story told incredibly well, and a great moment for Kawada too after a big year of major losses in 1993. Four and a quarter stars for this one. As the winner of the champion carnival, Kawada has punched his ticket back into the Triple Crown title scene. Two failures in his past, Kawada hopes that the third time will be the charm. But he's not just coming for the Triple Crown, oh no. To escape Misawa's shadow, he must take away all the gold, propping up the ace. May 21st, the main event at the Nakajima Sports Center. The Holy Demon Army challenges Misawa and Kobashi yet again for the World Tag Team Championships. This would be the first defense that Misawa and Kobashi make since winning the titles at the last year's Real World Tag League. The match opens with some of the traditional back and forth action but with some fun new elements that would pay off wonderfully later on down the line. For example, we're seeing the very dismissive and cruel way that Kawada kicks people off the apron to allow his team to maintain the advantage. In an addition to their first match from 93, this time the Holy Demon Army come in with a bit more of a strategy. Specifically, on top of just isolating Kobashi for the initial heat segment, they also attack Kobashi's notoriously injured leg. This also acts as a bit of retribution on Kawada's part as a leg attack was the Holy Demon Army's downfall in the Real World Tag League final. Even as Misawa tries to make the save, Kawada and Tawe just stay one step ahead. Of course, Kawada's own leg remains a weakness and Kobashi uses some of Kawada's own tactics with a punch and then going after Kawada's bad leg. This gives Misawa the opening to tag in and run wild, while Kobashi exacerbates the damage to Kawada's knee by driving it into a table at ringside. Again, Tawe plays the support, trying to keep things together and buy time for the team, but Kawada's knee continues to pose a problem. They're especially having trouble with Kobashi who continues to advance in skill and toughness with every passing year. That same toughness comes at a price, however, as at one point, Kobashi nails his patented moonsault, only serving to damage his own bad knee in the process. Misawa tries to compensate, but soon the Holy Demon Army are crafty enough to regain an advantage. This time, Kobada and Tawe work to chip away at Misawa, but Kobashi remains the thorn in their side, always making the save at just the right time. Kobashi's assist buys Misawa just enough time to recover and start dropping bombs on the Holy Demon Army. But this time, Kawada's able to make the saves for his own team. Kobashi yet again goes to the Moonsault to try to wrap things up, but when attempting a third, he misses. This is the mistake that the Holy Demon Army need to neutralize Misawa and attempt to put away Kobashi once and for all. Kobashi endures though, his fighting spirit fueling him onward until he finally nails a third moonsault to get the victory and retain the tag titles. This is a strong match, but a definite step back from the tightness and brilliance of the 93 Real World Tag League final. They're back to riffing on the material that they do have, and they're establishing tropes that will become cornerstones of these four pillars tag matches, especially later on down the line. 
That being said, it's still a great match. Four stars for me. One does worry a bit about the booking, however. Surely the Holy Demon Army should have won here to freshen up the tag title scene and heat up Kawada for the Triple Crown title match. Either way, Kawada is entering his third Triple Crown title match with Misawa without the momentum, and his uphill climb seems steeper than ever. June 3rd, Budokan Hall. It's the first Triple Crown Championship match of 1994, and it doesn't get any bigger. For the third time in the span of a single reign, Toshiaki Kawada challenges Mitsuharu Misawa for the Triple Crown Championship. The match opens with an exchange that establishes how well-versed both men are with each other. There's caution at play here, an understanding of the battles both men have faced with each other. It culminates in a wonderful reversal of the opening spot from their first title match, with Misawa nailing a brutal backdrop suplex on Kawada. From there, Misawa maintains an early advantage, even knocking Kawada down with a quick elbow. It's only when he takes a risk by leaping off the apron that Kawada is able to capitalize by elbowing Misawa on the way down. Kawada scouting Misawa's offense has allowed him to find an opening to put him in the driver's seat of the match. Kawada relies on striking to maintain the advantage. A kick even cuts up Misawa's ear, offering a nice little target for Kawada to aim at. Bleeding and beaten, Misawa switches gears and kicks out Kawada's famously bad leg, once again securing himself the advantage. Misawa takes his time here to attack Kawada's leg. There's not much to it that's very interesting, except when Kawada escapes a half crab by kicking Misawa right in the face. Kawada sells wonderfully, of course, yet again demonstrating why he's probably the best leg seller of all time. Kawada finally gets some momentum going, and this is when things start to go into overdrive. Everything after this explosive transition and comeback from Kawada is pretty much what this match is remembered for, as it's all high stakes and amazing action from here. Kawada begins to gain steam, but Misawa cuts him off with a real petty and great double leg takedown followed by a stomp to the head. Misawa nails a tiger driver, but only gets two. Misawa starts really applying pressure, but Kawada catches him coming off the top and nails him with a gamenguri to get things back in his favor. Kawada fights his way through a resilient Misawa to finally nail a vicious, dangerous backdrop. He follows up by finally nailing the folding power bomb, but only gets a two. Something happens in this particular sequence that hasn't happened yet in their first two title matches. For the very first time, Kawada isn't grasping at straws. He's not desperate. He's in control. He's dropping bombs. And maybe this time, he might just win the damn thing. In fact, the damage Kawada deals becomes so severe that Misawa has to roll to the floor after a gruesome German suplex to buy himself time. Kawada remains in control, getting a great near fall off of another folding powerbomb. Then, there's an excellent struggle over Kawada trying to apply the stretch plum. The fight that Misawa puts behind trying to block the hold is wonderful, and it makes the tension even greater when Kawada finally has it cinched in tight. There's also a wondrous moment while Misawa's locked into the hold as well. Just listen. Perfect. The crowd can sense that Kawada is closer than he's ever been, and that tonight might just be his night. But of course, if Misawa can hit an elbow, then he still has a fighting chance. A spinning back elbow knocks Kawada's lights out, and Misawa just starts dropping the man on his head. Sensing the match slipping away from him, Kawada throws himself at Misawa with a pair of rolling kicks that send Misawa to the floor. That gives us this gorgeous shot of Kawada in the ring, awaiting Misawa's return. It's here that I want to highlight some of the simple choices made in the cinematography and production of this match. When they're not directly engaged in action, I like how much emphasis the camera places on both men as individuals. It seems to really highlight how isolated they've become from each other, 
it helps give weight to the distance that's placed between them since splitting off as partners. Once Misawa does enter the ring, Kawada meets him head on, but even just a little time to recover is enough to give Misawa the power to hit back with his elbow strikes. Misawa is once again, as he always ends up being, in full control. Kawada makes a last ditch effort to fight back, but as we all know by now, Misawa's elbow is God. Misawa hooks Kawada up and drops him with the sickening Tiger Driver 91 to win one of the most iconic matches in the entire history of not just All Japan, but professional wrestling as a whole. After the match, both men show the wear and tear of the brutal fight, taking their time to rise back up. The winner Misawa even checks on Kawada and shakes his hand. It's the first time they've shaken hands since Kawada branched off to form the Holy Demon Army. Even then, it's not much of a consolation prize, is it? It's easy for the winner to show respect. He gets to walk away with the gold. Kawada leaves only with a battered body and a handshake. One of the famous debates that comes out of this title match is whether or not Baba made the right call, making Kawada lose his third championship match in a row against Misawa. Personally, I feel like asking that question here in 1994 is already asking it too late. Look at Kawada's year, and outside of him winning the champion carnival, there's very little to suggest that this June Triple Crown match will be the big one for him. Even his carnival win is tainted by the fact that he couldn't face Misawa in the block stages. Add on to that the fact that the Holy Demon Army lost the World Tag Team title match in the lead up to June 3rd, and Kawada doesn't really have any forward momentum. There is nothing in 1994 to really suggest that Kawada has progressed or developed a new edge that might help him finally unseat Misawa. If anything, that's achieved within the match itself and not with Baba's booking. Given the story being told, there was really no tangible reason to think that Kawada would win the title here outside of our internalized need to see matches in trilogies. The question really shouldn't be, did the right man win at 9394? The booking leaves very little doubt as to the answer. A better question is, did they have a chance to make the title switch before getting to this point? The more I think about this match, the more I feel like the right time for Kawada was a year beforehand in 1993. Heading into that title match, Kawada had formed a killer new tag team, won the tag team titles, defended them against Misawa and Kobashi, and even had Tawe's help in injuring Misawa's arm before the title match. All the pieces are in place in 1993 to have an entirely satisfying title change from ace Misawa to vicious heel Kawada, and yet it doesn't happen there. Should Kawada have won? No. He should have already won by this point, if you're asking me. Despite taking place on June 3rd in Budokan Hall, the match actually didn't broadcast in Japan until the following day on June 4th, or early morning June 5th if I'm understanding the report from The Observer properly. It would air at 1.35am on All Japan's standard half-hour television slot, directly opposed with New Japan's own television broadcast at the time. According to the June 20, 1994 edition of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, this broadcast would beat New Japan's by 33%, a pretty solid victory ratings-wise. There was, however, a problem. The observant among you would notice that the Misawa Kawada match is much longer than half an hour from bell to bell. That's not even including the entrances and ring announcements that would also make air for such a major match like this. Because of that, this match was actually aired in two parts in Japan. A reader of The Observer by the name of John Williams from Arcadia, California, would report that the June 4th broadcast ended with Kawada's knee drop from the second rope onto Misawa. Apparently, many of the fans watching closely on Nippon TV didn't know that was to be the case. The June 27th Observer reports that there were apparently tons of protesters and flooded switchboards at the offices of Nippon TV after the 6-4 television show only aired half of the Misawa Kawada match. 
In that same edition of The Observer, Dave Meltzer would share his own thoughts on the match. This match didn't have a lot of fancy moves, but everything was well-timed, stiff as hell, and the match had perfect psychology, and in that regard, it was the best match of the year. This didn't have the moves of the May 21st tag title match or the daredevil bumps of Pegasus Sasuke or Ramon Michaels, but it was far more brutal than any of those matches, and for heat and psychology, it was even better. He gave it the full 5-star rating, and in 2017, when he broke the scale in response to the Okada Omega match in the Tokyo Dome, he retroactively bumped the rating up to 6 stars. In the reader report that Williams sent, he wrote the following. I don't ever recall a Flair Steamboat match this good. It was so good that even though the wrong guy won for maximum reaction, it was still an all-time classic. The crowd's heat was unreal for the last 20, while it was the greatest cold match I've ever heard. In a 2019 Greatest Match Ever project undertaken primarily by members of the Pro Wrestling Only Forum as well as others, 6394 placed second on a list of the 100 Greatest Matches Ever. The following year, the match would drop to third place, having been overtaken by Akira Hokuto versus Shinobu Kandori from the first Dream Slam. For nearly three decades now, the match between Toshiaki Kawada and Mitsuharu Misawa on June 3rd, 1994 has been a canonical piece of professional wrestling. Its iconic status is such that more often than not, the match is referred simply by its date, 6394. Many longtime wrestling fans hear those numbers and understand exactly what is being discussed. For many pro wrestling fans, this is the greatest match of all time. It's the shorthand answer for greatest match of all time in the way that Ric Flair is the shorthand answer for greatest wrestler of all time. It will remain that way for a long time to come, regardless of what I have to say about it. Hell, everything there is to be said about this match has probably already been said on some message board or forum a dozen times over. So all that leaves is for me to say exactly what I think of this match. I watched 6394 twice while researching this video, and I've seen it even more times than that going all the way back to 2009 when I first started discovering Japanese wrestling. It's a match that took a long time for me to truly feel the impact of, even as I was discovering other famed matches from the King's Road era as a young fan, this never really hit me with the same kind of urgency and grandeur that the other matches did. I always maintained an intellectual respect for what it represented to many people, and I revisited it regularly to see what would change with time as I matured as a wrestling fan. Sometime in 2018 or 2019, I watched this match again, and it all finally clicked for me. The high stakes, the leg selling, the brutality of the closing moments, Kawada's desperate attempts to keep going as victory eludes him yet again. After years of hearing that this is the match, one of the greatest ever, perhaps the greatest ever, I finally got it. It's a great match, a fantastic match, absolutely. But the question is, is this the greatest match of all time? No. For me, it's not even a five-star match. The closing 20 minutes are unquestionably great. Tense, iconic, explosive. But the first 20 minutes getting to that point? It starts off strong with the hot opening exchanges, but it definitely settles into something a bit plain for a while. The fact is that I just don't enjoy either Misawa or Kawada's takes on mat work, so Misawa's control segment working over Kawada's leg just doesn't quite do it for me. Meanwhile, even though Kawada is more focused on impact and striking, I feel like he just kind of ignores Misawa's bleeding ear. I know some will point to his head kicks as targeting the ear, but those things are just things that Kawada would normally have done anyway. It doesn't really feel like a targeted attack in response to the bleeding. 
it's a great match, but it's a flawed match. It's not the greatest match ever. It's not even the greatest match that we've covered on the series so far. It has none of the desperate urgency of the Real World Tag League 1993 final. It doesn't have the masterful, pitch-perfect pacing of the 1991 Fan Appreciation 6-man tag. It doesn't even have the kind of seismic historic significance of the first Jumbo Misawa match in 1990. And it doesn't even come into the same level as what I believe to be the best match that I've covered in the entire series so far. Episode 2, Jumbo Saruta vs. Genichiro Tenryu from 6589. I watched these two matches back to back while writing this video, and Tenryu Saruta just has a vibrancy and an energy to it from minute to minute that Kawada and Misawa didn't match. For me, 6394 gets four and a half stars. Well worth the watch. Something that deserves to be studied and picked apart for ages to come so that we can continue to understand its best assets as well as its flaws. It's not my greatest match of all time. It never was. For our hunt for the greatest match of all time, well, there's always next year. But until then, there is a more pressing question to ask. Is there anyone left that can end the reign of Mitsuharu Misawa? Hi everybody, thank you so much for reaching the end of the video. I want to send a massive shout out and thank you to my lovely editors who helped me out. Thank you to IQ Wrestler for providing another banger of a title sequence. And thank you so much to Sam the VA Mod for helping me edit out the last few bits of this video. You guys are absolutely fantastic. Please check them both out online, on Twitter, on Twitch, YouTube, everything. Look for their stuff, they're great. And of course, a massive thank you to all my supporters on Kofi. Thank you to my one-time supporters in Dmitry Alexandrov, Eric Dellinger, J Reb, Jack Gardner, Carv Kutta, Jordy Lont, and Benjamin Dixon. And a huge thank you to my monthly supporters in James Draper, Captain Jack Heartless, Eddie Roberts, Jacob Dickens, Matt Brummett, Chick Fritz, Spiders in My Bed, Don Kiger, Arch Stanton, Timothy R. Buchner, In the Lane, Kid King Pin, Joe Humphreys, Henry, Christopher Jackson, Saltine Dalton, Peter Vinison, Dustin Faulkner, Edgar Molina, Fall Four Pillars of Hell, Sean, Emily, and Mason Rollison. You guys are absolutely fantastic. You guys help keep the channel afloat. Uh, I'm so incredibly grateful, especially for how the channel has been booming in the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. I'm so grateful. Thank you all, and have a good one.